All right, so let's continue. And we're, gonna, we're, we're discussing confidence intervals, and we're going to now talk about the t-distribution. And let's just catch up real quick. We were talking about population. So we have a group of people here, and here's the population distribution. So maybe we're looking at the heart rate. And so of all the people in the world, we might have a mean heart rate and a mean stand, and, and a standard deviation from the population. These are population parameters. And these things cannot really be measured because it's too cumbersome. There's too many people to measure. So these are unknowns, but these are things that we want to know. So what we do then is we take a random sample of people from here, uh, a smaller group that is much more manageable. And then in this random sample, we also get a distribution here. And since it's a much smaller number, we get uh, a, new, a, popular, a sample mean and a sample standard deviation. And these we can measure. So we use these to estimate these things that we want to know. But we know that this is a random sample. And we know we may have picked all our people from over here or over here or dispersed all around. So we're not sure how good this guess is, how good is this estimate. So what we did then is we are using a different distribution. We're using a distribution of the sample mean. And the way that we construct this is we take all the possible samples of sample size n. And so we take all those samples and we take their means and we plot those and that's how we get our distribution of sample means. Now this is also impossible to do because all possible samples of sample size n would be a huge number and so that's not something we can do. However, we do know some things about this distribution. We know that this distribution has a mean which we call mu sub x bar it has a mean that is equal to the population mean over here. and It has a, st a standard deviation, which we call the standard error, which is equal to this over here. Now, in the past, what we've been doing is we have been using this distribution, and we've been plotting our sample mean on it right over here, and we're saying, well, how far are we, how many standard deviations are we away from this mean here? Because we can do that because we have both of these values here right? Um, we can't, actually, because we don't know this, so we can't know this. And we don't know this, so we don't can't know this. And because we don't know this, we had a trick where we were actually using this, this kind of distribution here and saying how far is you know, how, how likely are we going to have this fall within that confidence interval. But in that trick, we were using our confidence interval formula, which equals, equals this. The 95% confidence interval is x bar plus or minus 2 times the standard error. However, we don't know this. We were, we were assuming that we did, and so we would we'd plug in here. But in actuality, most times we don't know this. So we need an estimate for this too. And what is our estimate for this? Well, the best estimate for this that we have is this, which is our standard deviation from the sample. So everything up to this point, we've already done before. So now here's the new thing. We don't know this. We need to estimate this somehow. And we have this here. So we can use that. And we do have an estimation for that. So we called uh, sigma sub x bar, the standard error of the mean, or sometimes we just called it the standard error. And so obviously, the estimation of this is going to be called the estimated standard error, standard error of the mean. And so this thing is, call, is uh, demarcated as s sub x bar, and it is equal to s over the square root of the sample size. So let me go to a clean page. So when you know x sub bar, which we rarely do, but let's just say when you do, then you can use our standard z uh, formula, which is uh, z equals x sub bar, or x bar minus mu over, over the standard error. Now when you don't know x uh, sigma x bar, the standard error, which is most of the time, because remember, you have to, you have to form that cur that uh, population uh, the not population the uh, distribution of sample means and that's very difficult to do so most of the time you don't know this we have to estimate it 
And so we're going to estimate it with this formula here. Well, we do know x bar, so we could use that. And we're going to use mu there again. And instead, we're going to use our estimated standard error, which is s sub x bar. Now, this here is not the same as this, obviously, right? This is an estimation of this. So we can't really say that this is going to follow our z table, our z distributions, because they're not. And it's going to follow something different. It's going to follow what we call a t distribution. And so now let's look at these again. So let's look at our standard uh, z distribution, which is normal shaped and it looks kind of like this. So this is our z distribution. And remember, we were using this to do all sorts of calculations before using z tables, etc. Now, the t distribution is an estimation of that. It's not going to be as exact because we don't have this exact value. So we're using this instead. So this distribution is going to be a little bit uh, more squished because it's going to be spread out more. And so that's what our t distribution would look like. So what you're seeing here is that there is more stuff out here to the periphery because we're not as exact. And we, we don't have as much clustered here in the middle because we're not sure that that's what it is because we're just making an estimate. Now there's one more thing. You'll remember that our estimation here, estimated standard error, came from our standard deviation from our sample over the square root of the sample size. So what does that mean? It means that the bigger the sample, the smaller this will be. So bigger samples are going to uh, have less variance. So I've drawn three t distributions here. One is this thin bluish line, one is our dark line, and one is our dotted line here. And so the bigger the the sample size, the more uh, of it of it is uh, here at the top, and the less of the less uh, variance that we have. So it's more clustered around this number. And the le the smaller the sample size, as you can see, the more squished this gets, the more flattened it gets, and the more stuff there is out at the periphery. In fact, if you have a sample size of infinity, then you're actually going to get the z curve, and so. That's what happens. The, the bigger the sample size is, the closer you get to this. So the z tables, they have to specify the sample size because if you're using a, a big sample size and you want to use a z table that corresponds to this curve, if you're using a small sample size, then you need to use the z table that corresponds to this curve over here. And there's one more trick about that. They don't just tell you what n is. They don't say, okay, for n equals 100, use this table. For n equals 50, use this table. For n equals 10, use this table. No. What they do is use something called degrees of freedom, which I've seen abbreviated as, as DF or even DOF. And what the degrees of freedom is equal to is n minus 1. And so if you have a sample size of 100, then you want to go look at the table at, that corresponds to a degrees of freedom of 99. If you have a sample size of 50, then you got to go find degrees of freedom for 49. And if it's 10, then you want to go find 9. The reason for this is beyond the scope of this, so don't worry about it. But just know that this is what degrees of freedom is. It's n minus 1. It's a sample size minus 1. So let's look at one of these uh, z tables right now. I'm sorry, I mean t tables. And so that's here's where, here we have one of these t tables. And you can see here the degrees of freedom are listed here, right? And so this would correspond to a sample sign of n equals 2, right? This would be n equals 11. And this would be, let's say, n equals 17, etc. And so depending on what your sample size is, that's the you need to pull up the proper one. So let's say we had a sample size of 10. So we have degrees of freedom equal to 9. So that's what we need. We need to find the one that has a sample size, I'm sorry, a degrees of freedom of 9. And that's this right here. So these are the numbers that we would use. OK, now let's look at the, uh, two other things here. It says one tail, two tail. What does that mean? Well, these are the tails here. And it says how much, what percent of this distribution is in the tail? Because remember, these are probability distributions. The area of this is all going to be 
one. And so we've been looking at things that we've been saying we want confidence intervals that were 95% confidence intervals. And what does that mean? That we want to be 95% sure that it, our, our uh, mean is in there. So we want this area to contain 95% of the values, right? So what does that mean is over here? Well, that means 2.5% is over there and 2.5% is over here. Now, if we were to use a one tail, that would mean 95% would be in this area, including everything that's over here. So that means it leaves 5% here. So obviously this tail, this red part's going to be bigger because it's got 5% here than this one, which has only got 2.5%. And that's why they make this specification here. If you want to have a two-tail uh, a two-tail one, then you come over here and say, well, we want to be 95% uh, sure. So let's look first at the one-tail version, meaning we want 95% of the value in here. We have our n equals 10, our degrees of freedom equals 9, so we want 95% in there. We're going to do the one-tail version, and so one-tail, 95.5% is not going to be included, so we're going to use this number, 1.833. This is 1.833 estimated standard errors from the mean, okay? Now for this one, it's a little bit further, right? And so really what we want to get to is um, the two-tail version of being 5%. And so we would have to come down to this one, which is 2.262. 2.262 would get us to the 95% to the in here. So we are 2.262 standard errors estimated standard errors from the mean. Uh, it's a little confusing. We're going to go through some examples where we're going to use this so that it'll get a little bit clear. But the thing that we're going to use for confidence intervals is this two-tail one. So this is the one that we're going to be paying attention to, and we're going to be looking at these two-tail numbers here, okay? Let's move to the next video where we'll try to use some of this information and make it make a little more sense.